Doubtless there were stirring and selfless deeds of rescue at Sheringham before the time for which we have records. Certainly one painting exists of a rescue carried out by a local vessel of a type called a pinker. It must have been a significant event as there are two pictures of it, a formal painting and a painting in the primitive style, though the latter seems to have a better understanding of the bow shape of Sheringham boats. The primitive painting gives the name of the boat as the Upshur. In 1836 there was a particularly fierce gale along the North Norfolk coast. Great damage was done at Sheringham and at Cromo. Seven local lives were lost in the storm. In the 1830s the Norfolk Shipwreck Association under the guidance of Lord Suffield had provided lifeboats to Cromer and Blakeney. So Charlotte Upshur, the widow of Sheringham landowner Abbot Upshur, decided to provide one for use by the fishermen of the town. It was named Augusta after their daughter, who had died of TB when only 20 years old. The Augusta was built by Robert Sunman, Sheringham wheelwright and boat builder. Modelled on the local fishing boats, she was somewhat larger at 33 and a half feet in length. Sixteen men were required to man the oars. The Augusta was launched for service in November 1838 and served until 1894, a very long period of service for a lifeboat. She stayed in a shed on the beach until the 1940s and while she was there her lines were drawn and published in an edition of Yachting Monthly. There are no detailed records for the services she carried out but it is clear that she made several significant rescues of passing vessels as well as meeting the needs of local fishing boats in difficulties. There were many boats fishing off the beach in the 19th century and the fishermen would have welcomed the availability of the lifeboat. It's thought that there were over 100 fishing boats based at Sheringham. In addition there was a considerable passing trade sometimes international but often coastal vessels journeying from the ports of Tees and Tyneside to London and back again. With little or no ability to forecast the weather and few havens of refuge on the Norfolk coast the wind would often drive them onto the sandbanks or onto the beach. In 1841 the Augusta launched to assist the Russian bark Digden, bound from Abo to Gibraltar. The Digden had spent two weeks in the North Sea, coping with adverse winds and with little idea of where she was, and with a crew apparently the worse for alcohol. At one point they thought that they were off the harbour at Dover. They had convinced themselves on sighting Blakeney Church that it was actually Dover Castle. The art of navigation in the early 19th century was never very precise, but Dover Castle is a rather more imposing building than Blakeney Church. Cox and Joyful West recalls the tradition from the time of the Augusta. We only had private lifeboats, 
And then uh, uh, the RNLI took a great interest because uh, the, the private lifeboats had done good work. The first one, they say, saved several hundred lives because of the, the crab boats going off in all kinds of weather and they were all pulling and sailing and it went miles. But anyway, the reason they, we got uh, uh, the RNLI interest, as I just said, we'd done a lot of good work with the private lifeboats. And so, in spite of the presence of the Augusta, the Royal National Lifeboat Institution decided to provide one of its boats at Sheringham. Captain Robertson of the Lifeboat Institution met with the Upshers and we can assume that there was agreement that having an institution boat as well as the Augusta would be beneficial. The lifeboat Duncan was certainly very different to the Augusta, being one of the institution's self-writing lifeboats with high end boxes. Rowing six oars each side, she was just one of over 250 lifeboats of this type stationed around the British Isles. The service board in the lifeboat house records other events over the years, including the long and arduous service in 1876 to the schooner Wells. Lloyd's list states that the lifeboatmen were exposed for many hours in the boat in a very heavy gale and tremendous sea with snow and sleet. The Upshers gave land for the building of a lifeboat house and a ramp was built to assist with the Duncan's launching. Today, the East Launching Slipway at Sheringham gives some idea of the sort of structure needed to provide a way across the stony beach. The ramp was about 50 metres to the west of the current ramp, running across from where the Mo Museum now stands. In more recent years, the boathouse has been the Sheringham Craft Centre and is now known as the Oddfellows Hall. The entrance to the building now reflects its original use. A walk around Sheringham is enhanced by the blue plaques featured on some of the buildings and the one on the Oddfellows Hall reminds us of the coming of the lifeboat Duncan. It's difficult now to envisage that a ramp led from the end of the building direct down to the beach, but there is one photograph that can help us see how it worked. The initial section of the ramp was concrete, leading to a wooden section across the stones. However, the constant movement of the beach meant that it rarely provided an easy route to launch the boat, and in the time of the next lifeboat, it was finally abandoned. Rock Armour now sits in front of the Mo, taking unwanted energy out of the waves and providing a degree of stability that wasn't previously possible. Comprehending the effort required to launch and operate the lifeboats at that time is also difficult. The high-end boxes provided the self-writing ability, but also set up wind resistance. The former Bembridge lifeboat can give an impression, albeit on very calm water, in this instance with a crew from Sheringham, Cromer and Wells. In 1885, the Sheringham men asked for a lighter but wider boat. Three fishermen visited the Lifeboat Institution's store yard in London. They chose another self-writer that incorporated many of the latest improved principles, including water balance tanks. The William Bennett arrived in the town in 1886. She had curved washboards running alongside the fore and aft end boxes and was in fact longer and heavier than the Duncan. These features, combined with a narrow access to the slipway and the ever-changing profile of the beach, made the William Bennett a very difficult boat to launch. And this is reflected in her meagre number of effective services. In 1900, it was decided that the only practical option was to keep the boat near the main east gangway, and photos show her being kept under tarpaulins at the end of Beach Road. This meant that the times when she could be launched were greatly extended, but the arrangement could only be temporary. The Lifeboat Institution committed to building a new boathouse a mile and a half to the west at the Old Hive. The cliffs at that point dropped down to beach level and the beach itself remained relatively stable. The boathouse was built and the William Bennett was moved there in 1902. The William Bennett's final service from the old hive was probably her most severe test. 
In a southerly gale, she launched to the steam yacht Asteroid in trouble off Cly. There were two men to each oar because of the distance involved. The William Bennett shipped a considerable amount of water in launching, and half a mile from the shore, she was buried by an enormous wave which tore away two of her oars. The lifeboat was finally able to make use of her sails. Eventually, she put several crew on board the yacht and then escorted her to harbour in Great Yarmouth. In total, the William Bennett was at sea for 20 hours in severe conditions. In the meantime, the fisherman's lifeboat, the Augusta, had deteriorated to the point that it was necessary to ask the Upshers if they would provide another one. As a result, a new lifeboat was built in the town by Lewis Buffalo Emery. Mrs Caroline Upshur paid for her and the boat was called after her late husband, Henry Ramey Upshur. She was named and put on service in the summer of 1894. The RNLI boats were considered better sea craft, but the Upshur was lighter and could usually be launched faster. In 40 years, she would be launched on service more than 50 times, saving at least 200 lives. As the fisherman's boat, she would endeavour to save both crew and the men's livelihood, the gear and the boats themselves. The Henry Ramey Upshur operated from the western fisherman's slipway and was kept in a boathouse at the top of the slope, where she can still be seen today. Launching a lifeboat from an open beach has always been the most difficult part of the boat's operation. Oars would often be used to get her through the breakers before a sail could be put up, or on other occasions the dipping lugsail could be set from the outset. A shoving off pole was another method of trying to provide momentum through the breakers, while on return from service the boat would be run straight onto the beach. It was then a matter of muscle power to recover her and haul her on skids back to the boathouse. Her last journey to sea was a celebration trip at the end of the Second World War, but a loud crack while at sea indicated a problem and the Ramey Upshur would not go to sea again. Most of her services had been to local fishing boats, but one of her most famous rescues was of the crew of the Norwegian vessel Ispullen in January 1897. The William Bennett couldn't launch direct from her boathouse because the wooden slipway was damaged. The Upshur was able to get alongside and take off the crew of eight. A particularly fine photograph of the Henry Ramey Upshur in front of the boathouse with crew in places with their oars gives a real feel for the pride and determination there was in having this boat. With over 150 fishermen available in town to crew the boats, there was doubtless rivalry, but the seafaring community seemed to have been happy to operate the RNLI and the private lifeboat without the problems that existed at some other stations. On the 26th of February 1900, the schooner Swan drove ashore just east of Sheringham in fog. The upshaw was launched though the crew of the vessel were able to make their way ashore in their own ship's boat. A wonderful set of photographs speaks volumes of life on the coast. With the crew saved, the vessel was breaking up on the beach and there was valuable salvage to be claimed. Young and old made their way to the beach to see what could be obtained and a photographer was on hand to record their comings and goings. Timber and rope general cargo and coal, it was a gift to the town. The event was such that a fine painting was also made of the occasion, probably using the photographs for reference. At the RNLI boathouse, now established across the golf course at the Old Hive, the William Bennett has succumbed to rot, probably brought on by the time she had to be kept outside under a tarpaulin. A new lifeboat, the J.C. Madge was provided for the station. Two of her early services were to the barges Gothic and Lord Morton, when she saved both their crews. Services to local whelp boats followed, 
but an attempt to save the crew of the Heathfield, aground on the Sheringham Shoal, was not successful. At that time, communication remained difficult, and there was no knowledge of the wreck until two of her crew managed to row to the shore. By the time the lifeboat reached the Heathfield on the Shoal, it was too late for the rest of the crew. The JC Madge was a non-self-writing boat of the Liverpool class, rowing 16 oars. She was the first of the lifeboats for which a short piece of film exists, taken in 1934. The occasion was Regatta Day, and as ever, everyone joined in to help get the lifeboat to sea. It was a major physical effort to shift stones on the beach, get the skids into place, and then to manhandle the boat to the water. However, amongst racing between the fishing boats and the yachts which had come down from Blakeney, the lifeboat held pride of place. The JC Madge had a crew of 19, 16 of whom would row when necessary. She also had drop keels, which assisted when she could set her sails. In February 1916, she was involved in a long and testing service when the steamship Ulla grounded on the Dudgeon Sands and then drifted towards Blakeney Overfalls. The lifeboat stood by her through the night and then escorted her to Hull, the lifeboat crew spending the night at Grimsby. They arrived back at Sheringham on the 28th, having launched on the 26th. In 1925, the JC Madge was alongside the Ingborg, which had run ashore on the beach to the east of the town. By laying out anchors and cables, the lifeboat assisted in saving the vessel. It's the tradition for a formal picture with the crew manning the oars was maintained for the J.C. Madge. Records at the museum dutifully state the names that go with the faces. With the boat itself conserved in the museum, there are those in town today who can say with pride, that's where my grandfather sat to row. Her final service was in 1936, in conjunction with the Cromer Motor Lifeboat, but it was not long before she was herself replaced at Sheringham by a motorboat. Both boats stood together on the beach for the naming ceremony for the Forester's Centenary, and then the JC Madge was sold out of the service for £80. The ancient order of Foresters had already provided a number of lifeboats around the British Isles, and they donated the funds for the Forester's Centenary to come to Sheringham. Getting to the lifeboat house at the Old Hythe had been an exhausting business even before setting about launching, and so the current lifeboat house was built, though it can still be a bit of a puff to get there. This boathouse had an interesting launching arrangement. The narrowness of the beach at high water led to the construction of the boathouse parallel to the sea, and a turntable outside enabling the lifeboat to be turned onto her slipway. At high water, the boat could be manhandled into the sea. At low water, a tractor could now be attached to get the lifeboat across the beach. The operation of the Forester's Centenary was well recorded in 1955, in a film now kept at the East Anglian Film Archive. Brian Coe was a young employee of the film company Kodak and he was well supplied with new film types to try out and given a free hand for its use. He came to Sheringham in June and July and enlisted the help of the fishermen and lifeboat crew in making a film about their work. He must have been very persuasive as they clearly went to great lengths to help him. The rescue scene they staged is particularly dramatic. Quite a lot of seawater has been allowed to gather in the fishing boat to add drama to the occasion.
joyful West, seen here on the left, wearing the second coxswain's life jacket, recalls the forester's centenary. Oh, she's a lovely boat. She wasn't a dry boat. No. And, uh, you know, but uh, she, she was a nice boat of, of that age, that time. She had just one, one engine, of course, and um, uh, open. But um, she was a good, good boat, and I'm going alongside, or anything like that. And she took up a good bit of hammering, you know, because she was really strong when it built. I always thought this boat took more harm on Sheringham Beach than any, because uh, you know how, how it is when they hit the lost stones. They take unless we really look after them. We did looked after them well. They took some punishment. Tell them you got them out of the water. And this boat, well, because of the, of the time she was here and uh, the launches she had, I, I thought she was built very strong and became one of our favourites. The outcome of Brian Coe's film is a splendid record of a boat that had been busy in the business of life-saving, especially of airmen in downed aircraft, all through the Second World War. The Sheringham lifeboatmen of that era were no strangers to having their pictures taken, as we shall see in a few moments. The Forester's centenary arrived at the old Hythe boathouse in June 1936 and was based there until the building of the new boathouse at the end of the West Promenade was complete. Her naming ceremony was on July the 18th, and 2,000 members of the Foresters attended the ceremony, 800 of them coming on a special train from London. The JC Madge was alongside, providing a very useful viewing platform for the ceremony. Soon the new boathouse was ready and the boat made its last launch from the old hive. The trailer was hauled along the beach and the new, the current boathouse, became the centre of operations. With her engine she was of course heavier than her predecessor and depending on the state of the tide and the beach sometimes 100 helpers were needed to manoeuvre her. Eventually a tractor was provided. Her initial services were to local boats, but it wasn't long before wartime meant a far greater variety of calls. There was an extensive search in January 1940 after an attack on the East Dudgeon light vessel. Hazel Makins, daughter of lifeboat mechanic Teddy Krask, recalled him listening to the shipping channel on the radio. All of a sudden he shouted, listen, he heard this voice saying, um, the East Dudgeon lightship was being bombed over and over again and of course he jumped up and then it was all systems go. He phoned the honorary secretary Harry Johnson and he phoned the, he got in touch with the Coast Guards and the Coast Guards had not heard it, nobody had heard it. It was a January day and it was awful conditions but they went and it took three hours to get there and as they approached at the East Dudgeon, looked fine. And uh, then as they came alongside, they realised there was no sign of life. They found a light was smashed and a window was, I think, smashed. But the telling thing was the lifeboat was missing, so they guessed what had happened. And um, so they searched, obviously, in the direction they thought. Um, they would have gone, didn't find anything, came home. Then um, the next day they had a call to go to, to go search west and they got as far as clay and they were recalled and um, sadly the boat had been washed up and the men drowned or except one who had 
crawled up the beach. This was in Lincolnshire by then, and they came back. But the, the mystery there was who sent this message, this call. For some reason, the war ministry or whoever wanted to know who sent it. And they inquired of coast guards and airfields and dad, of course, to find out who sent this call. And uh, they, they, it wasn't a ship. They confirmed that it was no, not a British ship, not a British plane. And they came to the conclusion that it was um, a German with a conscience. Then, in February, an enemy aircraft attacked the coaster Boston Trader. The lifeboat was launched within 20 minutes and rescued seven crewmen who had escaped in the ship's boat. It seems that Reuben Sademan, photographer for the popular Illustrated magazine and one of four photographer brothers, may well have been in Cromer doing a story on the Cromer lifeboat when he learned that the Sheringham boat was at sea. He was able to get to Sheringham to capture the moments when the crew of the Boston Trader were brought ashore. Later he would return to Sheringham and cover the station and its men in much more detail. We have a wonderful selection of photographs of fishermen and lifeboat crew as a result of that visit. Hazel Makins has very distinct memories of one picture in particular. I was actually in the room when this picture of Teddy on the couch was uh, taken. Um, I can remember the photographer coming in and uh, setting up all his equipment uh, on a tripod. I was quite impressed. And um, I had to stand in a corner and keep very, very quiet and not move. And, um, oh, I hardly dared breathe it was, as it was being taken. Uh, the photo is, I think, obviously pose but quite authentic in that dad would crash out like that uh, on the couch if he had a minute or two. The sea boots, yes, they were part of the furniture really, um, but the sou'wester, I can never remember having seen a sou'wester in the house, so that part was obviously set up. The classic group of the crew in front of the boat and the individual shots of the men are masterpieces of black and white photography and the experience of those wartime years can be seen in the faces. Of the airmen rescued during the war years off the East Anglian coast, over half were brought safe to land by the Sheringham lifeboat. With many of the young men of the town away, there was a shortage of manpower for the lifeboat launches. But there was a solution, also recorded by Reuben Sademan. The Honorary Secretary of the Lifeboat, who instituted launches, would call the crew and then call the local army commander, and a launch party was provided. One or two even had the chance to make a voyage on a lifeboat exercise. In the October of 1941, the lifeboat made a tricky launch and journey to the Eagles Cliff Hall in Trouble off Cly. The Eagles Cliff Hall had been built for the Great Lakes of North America, but had been pressed into service for convoy duties across the Atlantic. The rescue of 15 men in the northeasterly gale resulted in the award of a bronze medal for gallantry to coxswain Jimmy Dumble. He led the crew on 56 services during the wartime years. 34 of which had been to aircraft and their crews. Sitting on the Forester's centenary, Joyful West talks of both boat and men with affection. This is the boat you, you joined and doing your training in. And you're in good company with knowing crew, so that uh, most of them were uh, wartime crew at that time. And so you had, you had the road the top, top men with you, working with you, and you picked up from them, you know. But um, yes, he's uh, done sterling service uh, all, all through the war and um, after the war. Sparrow Hardingham and then Downtide West took over as coxswain. 
Downtide received the institution's thanks on vellum for the service to the Turkish steamer Zor and a silver medal for a service in 1956 to the collier Wimbledon. The Wimbledon ploughed regularly up and down the east coast. She was owned by one of the London electricity companies and her job was to keep their power station supplied with fuel. Until that fateful day when she sank off Blakeney. The survivors from her crew were landed at Wells. A proud downtide West accepted his service certificate in a ceremony on the lifeboat at Sheringham and later received his medal in London. In 1960, the Forester's Centenary had seen 25 years service in the town. New types of lifeboat were under development. Brian Pegg, then a crew member, remembers when matters came to a head. When uh, we launched about three parts away of the sand, Teddy Crask was a mechanic down Todas Carkson, which is really a fine time. Towed three parts away of the sand, you know, to launch on a carriage. And when we went off the carriage, down Toad said, Teddy, give the lot now. Give the lot. He said she had the lot ever since we've been in the water. <laughs> and uh, she wasn't man enough, you know, really. Uh, and that's the start of the new boot. Brigadier Kent Lemley, the onsec. And uh, he rang London straight away and explained to him, you know, there's a lot of swelling and all that. And, that's about time he had a bigger boot or something more powerful. The result was that the Sheringham station was recommended to receive one of the first of the new Oakley-class lifeboats. The Forester's Centenary was launched for the last time and there was a short interim before the coming of the new boat. The Anglia television cameraman was at the end of Cromer Pier on the 10th of July 1961 to capture his pictures as she steamed by. There was a good crowd on the beach at Sheringham to greet her as she arrived. As with her predecessor, and as with all the local crab boats, she was run straight onto the beach. She was soon installed at the boathouse and ready for a trial launch. Plenty of manpower was still required at the initial stages, and this would remain the situation throughout her time of service. The cameraman took great trouble to film all aspects of her complicated launch and recovery procedure. His sequences remain perhaps the best film documentation of the operation of the boat. After the rotation of the turntable, great care was always required to keep all nine tons of the boat under control as she was lowered down the slipway. Coxon downtied west in the white cap kept a keen eye on all aspects of the process. The boat was named the Manchester Unity of Oddfellows, just as with the Forester Centenary, after the friendly society that donated her. Cox and West and many of the crew were members of the society, and the Oddfellows remained generous donors to the station to the current day. The Oakley class of boat was the first lifeboat designed to have a high degree of inherent stability and also to self-right in the event of a capsize. The hull was built of wood. The design was for carriage launching and for handling on beaches, though experience did lead to some strengthening work to the hull carried out later in her first year. The use of tractors for beach launching had been pioneered along the coast at Hunston some 30 years earlier, and such a vehicle with the ability to drive well into the water was now on hand. A separate shed had been built along the beach to house the tractor. Once the carriage with the boat chained to it had been driven far enough into the water, the side chains could be released and the vessel entered its natural element. After the single 35 horsepower engine of the Forester Centenary, the twin 43 horsepower Perkins of the Manchester Unity gave a speed of nearly 8 knots. Then later in her life she was re-engined with 52 horsepower Thornycrofts. The shore crew at Sheringham were already experienced at handling a large and heavy vessel on the beach but there were new features provided with the tractor and carriage and new techniques to take on board. Winch and wires, skeets under the keel, 
and wheels to attach to the side of the vessel were all part of the procedure. The Manchester Unity of Oddfellows now sits in the Mo, the museum on Sheringham Seafront, and most of the kit associated with her launching and rehousing can be seen there. To appreciate the process you can see on this film. Whilst the turntable in front of the boathouse was a feature designed for a specific need at Sheringham, you'll still find that beached lifeboats today around the British Isles require a committed shore team working alongside the seagoing crew. By the time the Manchester Unity of Oddfellows was named by Princess Marina in 1962, Cox and Henry Downtide West had already led her to the rescue of four from a converted ship's lifeboat off Clyde. The following year, the lifeboat was launched to a cabin cruiser, apparently out of control. The coxswain had to adopt the slightly unusual tactic of colliding with it to stop the circling vessel. It had to be assumed that the lone skipper had already fallen overboard. The Manchester Unity would prove to be a busy lifeboat, particularly with so much of the work of the Lifeboat Institution now being concerned with those who go to sea for leisure rather than commerce. Services to the Concorde II and the Dora Lee being of this nature. Over the decades, there had also been increasing cooperation with the rescue helicopters. The Manchester Unity went through various guises during her service. Initially, she had grey upperworks, then an orange cabin top, and eventually the Lifeboat Institution decided all lifeboats should be day-glow orange on all their upperworks. Again, she started as an open boat. Brian Pegg. We'd done the first canopy, and uh, I always remember dust had a little windscreen about, I'm guessing about 10 or 12 inches, that's all. But that didn't keep much. I kept a little off for the cops. Between ourselves, and we didn't ask permission, <laughs> we rugged one up. And uh, we had to tread gently at the time because, you know, we, in, the, when, in the early stages of the Oakleys you had uh, inspectors often popping in, you had uh, people from the drawing board popping in, asking questions. And, oh, it, it was always somebody and uh, we didn't let no, nobody say it at the right start with in case they said, chuck it out, you know, they ain't allowed. Eventually, she had a completely enclosed cockpit, and the idea first implemented at Sheringham became standard for all her class. It's in the nature of lifeboat service, certainly in times past, that the last thing you think of when at sea with a particular task in hand is taking a picture or some film. And the official film is often of fair weather, summer lifeboat days and formal occasions. But we are fortunate that both crew members and supporters did occasionally try and record events, catching winter morning seas and the drama of survivors being brought ashore. The Manchester Unity of Oddfellows would be launched to cover the return of the local fishing boats when they'd been caught by the wind and waves picking up as they carried out their early morning emptying of the pots. On the long open coast between the havens of Great Yarmouth and Wells Next the Sea, Coasters and cruisers would make simple errors, be caught by a gathering wind, or suffer some mechanical failure. Coxswain's Joyful West, Jack West and then Brian Pegg would guide the boat through the waves. Occasionally, bowman Jack West was in command, such as the difficult service to the Fosina in 1972. The restless wave and the harvester, the smiling Swiss and the tour Gothia are just a few of the other events remembered by the names of the boats and crews that were assisted. A particularly notable service took place in 1985 with Cox and Jack West at the helm. Two divers investigating a wreck two miles north of Overstrand were missing. Cromer lifeboat was searching that area but with a strong current running crewman Donald Little on the Sheringham boat spotted them two miles off West Runton. Yet another letter of commendation was received at the Sheringham station from Lifeboat Headquarters for that service. In 1989, the Manchester Unity of Oddfellows had been on station for 29 years, a very long time for a lifeboat. 
as a crowd gathered at the boathouse to say farewell to her. Her replacement, Lloyd's too, was waiting beyond the surf. Her long-serving retired coxswain, Henry Joyful West, spoke of her service to the town and then went on board for her final launch. New coxswain and lifeboat bronze medal holder Clive Raymond took over for the new boat, but already there were dark clouds on the horizon for Sheringham. The changing nature of services by the lifeboat, more services, but primarily to smaller craft, led to the difficult decision to withdraw a full offshore lifeboat from Sheringham in 1992. Joyful West explained the spirit on the station. Couldn't be lower. Could not be lower. This town and the crew and the branch were really hit. Uh, we still thought we had a chance at one time because we'd done a lot of homework. Reasons why we should have a lifeboat here. Coomer can't get back was a strong point. The traffic that passed by here anyway. We'd done all of our homework as much as we could to save our stage, or save our offshore lifeboat. But it uh, wanted to be, and um, Eventually, we had to give way to uh, more speed either side of us. It was a bitter blow. That was how it was. But the town and the station could not be any lower than we were when we lost the offshore lifeboat. An inshore lifeboat and then an Atlantic 21 craft were on station for two years, and then an Atlantic 75, a high-speed inshore rescue craft considered to be ideally suited to the kind of services required. For the years 1994 to 2007, she again carried the name Manchester Unity of Oddfellows. The turntable at the boathouse was no longer required, but updated crew facilities and equipment were provided along with the boat. In 2001, she was involved in a particularly challenging rescue, assisting five divers and needing to use the crew's first aid skills to the full. It was an illustration of how the commitment of the crew and the town to the lifeboat service had revived. But the heritage of the offshore boats and the difficulties of the change to the new high-speed craft would be remembered in a number of ways. Eastern Angles, the touring theatre company for the East of England, created a play around the story. The cast visited the station and the production was taken around the towns of the region. As part of the events around the play, the Little Theatre organised a young people's art event. And a team with its heart and the heritage of the boats themselves was determined to do so much more. Many hours of behind-the-scenes voluntary effort went into the challenge of saving the historic lifeboats. The Manchester Unity of Oddfellows had been decommissioned and had gone to Chatham Docks. The Friendly Society bought her for a second time and she came back to Sheringham with the possibility of a heritage centre in mind. Coxon, Joyful West and his son had tracked down the Forester's centenary converted to a fishing boat and taking anglers to sea from Burnham on Crouch. The Foresters would make an overland journey back to Norfolk. The converted JC Madge was known in Brancaster and her owner contacted in Lincoln. With the considerable help of local donations, national grant assistance and a great deal of commitment from a local team, all three lifeboats were now back in town. For the JC Madge, much of the restoration was done at the International Boat Building Centre in Lowestoft, while the local team concentrated on the other two boats. In 1999, all three were assembled on the West Cliff top for a celebration of 175 years of the Royal National Lifeboat Institution. The RNLI 
had been forgiven for its decision to take away the offshore boat. With a great deal of vision and continuing commitment, plans were made for a final resting place for all three vessels. The opportunity arose for a new town museum to be built at the Mo. The two older boats were in place as the museum was developed around them. Then came the day in 2009 to move in the Manchester Unity of Oddfellows. It was an early start for all the helpers as the boat on her original trailer trundled through the town. At the bow was a heavy-duty tractor, a stern members of her crew who had formerly used the steering arms to guide the carriage down the slipway to the sea did the same job as she travelled down Weybourne Road and then Station Road. A squeeze around a corner and once more she was back beside the seaside, edging out past the car park. There was a pause for the helpers to have their picture taken and some discussion with the contractors about the wind strength and whether she could be swung out over the sea. The lifting strops were put into place. A quick aerial trip, lifeboat and carriage, over the Crown car park, and the Manchester Unity was lowered gently onto the cradle that had been placed on the museum floor. For the foreseeable future, that was the last time she would move. The roof of the museum could now be built. Meanwhile, at the operational lifeboat station, in 2007, it was time for another boat. Once again, the friendly society stepped forward, and now the boat's name is just the Oddfellows. The Sheringham lifeboat is now an Atlantic 85 class vessel, this being taken from her length of just under 8.5 metres. She's the very latest of the high speed rigid inflatables, evolved from the first inshore lifeboats and the Atlantic 21s. It may be a 999 call from the public or a distress signal from a boat at sea, but as soon as the lifeboat operations manager at Sheringham or the Coast Guard Control Centre at Great Yarmouth decide a lifeboat is needed anywhere along Sheringham's stretch of the coast, a team of volunteers assembles at the boathouse. The boat is usually on the move within five or six minutes of the first call. Because there's no knowing what might be involved or how long they might be at sea, every crew member must don full seagoing kit, including helmet. The tractor is ready in position at all times to push the lifeboat out. At high water, the boat launches from the slip. At low water, she'll be pushed across the beach. Once on the water, the lifeboat is in her element. With the engines lowered, the boat needs just under a meter of water in which to operate. So close inshore work is possible. The two outboard engines generate 115 horsepower each. As the speed increases, the boat lifts in the water and planes on her hull. She can reach a top speed of 35 knots or 40 miles per hour. At full speed, the odd fellows can be at sea for two and a half hours. The lifeboat will go to sea on service with a crew of three or four. We've already mentioned the protective clothing. This consists of a warm one-piece undergarment and then the dry suit which seals at the neck. The life jackets are designed for maximum flexibility and the helmets have visors to protect the eyes. Because of the forces to which the crew are exposed, especially when the boat makes a turn or in rough weather, each crew member has both hand grips and loops into which they put their feet. The construction of the boat is a carbon fibre and foam core laminate. This gives great strength but keeps the internal structure of the lifeboat to a minimum. 
The foam is a very tough material that has the ability to absorb and recover from high impact loads such as pounding through waves at speed. The hull and overall design allow the boat to be beached in an emergency without causing damage to the engine or steering gear. The sponsons or inflated side pieces of the boat are made from synthetic rubber. There's an inflatable bag on the A-frame at the stern of the boat. Should she capsize, this can be blown up and will instantly turn the boat the right way up. Each crew member has a microphone and speakers built into his helmet so they can talk to each other, with their boathouse and with the coast guards. Controls are placed in front of each crew member and in the centre of the control unit the boat now has a satellite navigation system with all the local charts. The coast guards in Great Yarmouth generally coordinate all rescues through the VHF radio system. The Atlantic 85 can operate in all kinds of weather. In daytime, it can go to sea in conditions up to wind force 6 to 7 and at night up to force 5 to 6. The method of rehousing at Sheringham will depend on the state of the tide and the condition of the sea. As with launching, the shore crew and seagoing crew work in close cooperation. On a calm sea, and at low water, the tractor and trailer will go down to the water's edge and the fully waterproof tractor can push well out into the sea. Under such conditions, the boat's crew can use the tide to drift down and, at the right moment, reverse the lifeboat directly onto its carriage. It's difficult to steer the lifeboat when it's going astern and it's not always as easy as they make it look. For part of the day, there will be a strong current running from east to west and at other times of the day, it's running in the opposite direction. Once on the trailer, the crew grabs the ropes at the side of the carriage and the tractor driver takes over, pulling both boat and trailer clear of the water. We'll go back onto the water to see an alternative method of landing. This technique will be used when the water is up on the slipway and in heavy weather. The trailer is prepared with her capture net and moved into position. This time the lifeboat will drive straight onto the trailer and the net will bring her to a rapid stop. Steering the lifeboat is very much easier when she's going forward and in difficult conditions the helmsman will need this capability. Of course she's now the wrong way round on her trailer so will have to be reversed at the earliest opportunity. Once again, with the boat safely on her trailer, she'll head back to the boathouse. But there's still work to do. As with all RNLI lifeboats, a good washdown with fresh water will remove all the salt and greatly extend the life of both the lifeboat and the crew's kit. And it's important, of course, that refueling is done straight away. Behind the visible work of the volunteer seagoing and shore crews, there's paperwork to be done. And behind the whole team is the support of all who contribute to the work of the RNLI through generous donations. Once all is complete, the lifeboat is pulled back into her boathouse and a phone call is made to the Coast Guards at Great Yarmouth to report that Sheringham lifeboat is rehoused and ready for service. And so the proud tradition of service through the operation of its lifeboat continues at Sheringham. When the museum at the Mo was opened by the Duke of Kent in 2010, it was entirely appropriate that he first visited the operational lifeboat station and met the current seagoing and support crews. He then called in at the Mo, recalling when he last stepped on board the Manchester Unity in 1975. He particularly wanted to know that she had been well used for her original purpose and was pleased to hear that this was most certainly the case. Today the lifeboat has been joined by RNLI lifeguards patrolling the seafront, seeking to offer support and take initial action when required but it's in the operational boat that the true spirit of the community is found. 
We all appreciate the voluntary and professional services which come to our assistance when help is needed. For seaside communities all around the country, it's perhaps the lifeboat which best focuses such attention. Whether it's the action of life-saving when needed, or simply knowing that there is a team in training, ready just in case, provokes a pride which is important to the human spirit. There is nowhere that this is appreciated more than in Sheringham. <laughs>